Welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Heather Auden, and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement at York, and happy to welcome you all here today. Um, thank you for joining us in today's lecture titled Meritocracy, Is It Truly Worth the Price and How Do We Continue to Live With It? Presented by Keisha Krishnamurthy, instructor at the Schulich School of Business. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge, uh, before we begin, the land I am on. Because we may not be gathered in the same place, uh, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be for the territory you are on. Um, so please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on. Uh, the website native-land.ca is, uh, is a good resource for this and we'll put it up in the chat. As a member of the York University community, I've recognized that many Indigenous nations have long-standing uh, relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee, uh, Confederacy and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the credit of the First Nation. This territory is subject of the is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now, um, we would like to conduct a quick poll before each session begins. Um, so we're going to put a poll up in the chat. Um, and the question is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? And it should pop up on your screen right now. Um, I'm going to give everybody a moment to respond. Okay. Hopefully you've had a chance to respond. And I thank you. It, it is helpful for our speakers to know more about who is in our audience um, before we get started. Okay, um, at any point during the webinar, if you need help with Zoom, um, feel free to click on the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and enter a question. Our team is there um, and ready to help you. 
And then that same button can be used if you would like to submit a question um, for our guest speaker to answer during the Q&A period. Um, and please do note that all of our questions and comments are visible to our panelists and staff working behind the scenes. So we do ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Keisha Krishnamurti. Keisha currently teaches part-time at York University and the University of Toronto. He is a PhD graduate from the University of Massachusetts, and his research covers the areas of business history, organizational theory, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. He was part of the Anti-Asian Racism Working Group at the University of Toronto, and is currently among the editorial staff at the Journal of Management History. Uh, we are pleased you could make the time to join us today. So uh, welcome, Keisha. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction, Heather, and I am very glad to be here. Um, allow me to begin with my presentation. Uh, I'll be going ahead and hopefully I'll be done in less than 20 minutes and that way we can have more time for questions. So, um, I'm going to be talking about something that's been a part of my research and actually a really big part of my dissertation, and that is the whole theory and practice of meritocracy. And while I will also be asking about whether or not it is truly worth the price and how we continue to live with it, I also have to acknowledge that this is a topic that, for the absence of a better term, is um, somewhat ambiguous. A lot of people have different ideas about what a meritocracy is and what it means to them. So I will be starting out with a definition. Um, I will first be talking about meritocracy's origins, the issues posed by meritocracy and what we can do about it. And I start with the definition of a meritocracy just so that we're all clear about it. And especially since this is a term that a lot of people also haven't come across or have come across but haven't really heard about. So very simply put, a meritocracy is a social system where merit or talent is the basis for sorting people into positions of power and authority and distributing rewards so that the positions of the highest authority are occupied by those with the greatest merit. Now, this could be, you could argue that for instance, in our current world, say billionaires, have the greatest merit because they're in positions of power and authority have the greatest money. Other people might dispute that, but you get the general idea of what a meritocracy is. And a lot of people who hear about this go ahead and ask the question, um, so what? Isn't this how the world works? That people who have talent and merit go and get ahead. Now, I ask the question like, really decides who is qualified to have wealth and power and authority? Is there any objective way to measure something called merit? And if somebody is already rich and powerful and their kids tend to benefit from that, don't they get a way to step ahead? Don't they have new networks to access? Don't they have a different position that they're coming from? Something higher than what most other people are. There are a lot of questions to ask about this, and especially now. Um, I will be going in about the origins of meritocracy because this also matters. And I have to acknowledge that the word itself is relatively recent. It was coined by a British, British sociologist named Michael Young, excuse me, in a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. Now, this book was written as a satire by an anonymous author from the year 2034, which is 10 years away from now. And he made it quite clear that this idea of meritocracy was really a dystopia, that this was not a very good way to run the world. But nevertheless, the word has been unironically adopted as something really good. I will try to uh, pull that apart in the time that I have. And if it seems natural to us, it's because A, it has spread a lot during the 20th century as an idea, and B, we have come through, in, many of us have come through 
intensely meritocratic educational systems. We've passed multiple exams. We've had to work really hard to be here. And it just seems right and fair that we enjoy the rewards of our hard work and all the talent and all the effort that we've had to bring to the fore. And it certainly is a whole lot more fair to have a meritocracy than to have some kind of hereditary aristocracy or a feudal system. And everybody kind of agrees with that, yes. Nobody wants to return to having some kind of a feudal system, but meritocracy, unfortunately, brings its own problems with it, which I will go into. Now, there are two important things that I would like to acknowledge. The first thing is that meritocracy is an old idea. And in fact, one of the best known examples is from Imperial China, where you had bureaucrats being chosen on the basis of merit, possibly as far back as the second century BCE. Um, this particular painting um, is from the Song Dynasty, but apparently it was painted later. And this shows the emperor of China actually receiving an applicant from a palace exam. And to this day, the Chinese bureaucracy is intensely based on examinations and is quite intensely meritocratic. However, when it comes to the idea of merit, there has never really been one single idea of merit. And there's an excellent paper by Jonathan Mice that talks about how the idea of what constitutes merit, what qualities are essential for somebody to rise up the ranks have changed from society to society. And he also makes the case that in our present world, the idea of just how much merit you really need or how much it matters, again, changes from society to society and that it's not consistent in our world at present, not right now. Um, so where do our current ideas about meritocracy come from? Now I am skipping through, there's actually a lot of historical material, but I'm just skipping straight to the point that our current narratives about meritocracy are very heavily American influenced. And yes, this has to do with the fact that America is politically and economically dominant, but also, as the result of the post-Cold War world. And I will get to that um, meritocracy in American history and to the Cold War, which is where my research is. Now, one of our key figures is the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who used the term unnatural aristocracy. And he had a long exchange of letters with another American president, John Adams, and a close colleague of his, discussing the nature of this natural aristocracy. And Jefferson's idea was that people who nature has endowed with genius and virtue should be called to public service without regard to wealth or birth or any other accidental condition or circumstance. The idea was that it didn't matter who you were. If you were smart and you were capable, you should be educated and you should be made fit for public service and reap the rewards of it. And he very famously said that the best geniuses should be raked from the rubbish annually. That is a paraphrase of a quote of his, but it actually captures the idea quite well. Um, President Adams, in his response to Jefferson, said that a natural aristocracy, no matter how good, also runs the risk of becoming solidified and corrupted in the future, one way or the other. And both of them had a long disagreement about it, even if both of them agreed that they needed some kind of an aristocracy. Now, this kind of thinking is very prominent within the United States and actually has been ever since the time of the American Revolution, the 1780s. American revolutionaries called themselves the men of merit. And they believed that merit allowed them to enjoy positions of high power and influence in a country that had an extremely egalitarian constitution for its time. The American constitution was in many ways a radical document from that era. And especially going on through the 19th century and into the 20th, American society became increasingly interested in the idea of standardized testing to come up with an objective idea of who was fit to govern. And IQ tests emerged around the time period of the First World War as a part of this testing, as a part of this uh, desire to identify those individuals who were qualified for high positions in American society. And the belief that you could measure 
merit, you could measure fitness, you could measure talent and value in a single objective measure is something that is strongly American, but which has actually since spread. Now, why has this, this of course spread through American education, but one of the things that is often overlooked is the reason why American education has been so successful and why this idea has been spread. And this is really not an accident, and it actually deals again with a great political event, the Cold War after the Second World War. Now you have, of course, the United States and the Soviet Union facing each other off politically, economically, ideologically, militarily. That image is Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin. In the foreground, you see American tanks. In the background, you see Soviet tanks personnel on both sides staring each other off. Now, what is much less known is that the Cold War was also a battle of education in which both the United States and the USSR attempted to bring in students from across the world to their universities and also to set up new universities in different countries to influence future leaders and thinkers of countries that were becoming independent, newly decolonized countries. Of course, starting out with India and Pakistan and later spreading across Africa and across Asia, you had countries becoming independent of European colonial rule and seeking to develop themselves. And both the superpowers wanted to have that influence. Now, American education was heavily meritocratic in nature and Within America, there was a great belief that social structures need to be influenced and people who are already in positions of power and authority should be convinced of the superiority of the American way. The Soviet Union, given the communist ideology of the time, instead tried to instill revolutionary ideas in the same countries. And this actually caused many local leaders and elites to feel like they were being threatened because communist ideology talking about revolution and class overthrow really did not go well. But American education and belief in meritocracy was a message that resonated increasingly with them. And this is part of a spread of what you might almost call an American project. Now, this is actually the area of my research. And if anyone has questions about it, feel free to ask me. I won't go into much detail right now because I could go on this for quite a while, to be honest. Anyway, we are now living in the post-Cold War world. The Soviet Union is old history. Communism itself has been quite thoroughly discredited or has turned into something more like state capitalism as what we see in China. And you have the spread of an increasingly meritocratic system across different countries in the world. We have greater and greater belief in the American ideal. Now, the belief that one can rise to the top with hard work and talent and perhaps a little luck has started to result in greater and greater inequality. And we see the effects of that happening politically. Now, people who rise to the top feel like we've like say, oh, we've earned our position, we have earned our privileges justly, but those who do not, and often for no fault of their own, land up being branded as failures, all of these undeserved differences at birth. It could be your gender, it could be your sexual orientation, it could be the color of your skin, it could be any of these things that you have absolutely no control over that could go ahead and make unfair changes about your ability to climb the social ladder. They could pull you down. And the trouble is that this tends to legitimate inequality in a way that is deeply toxic. Nobody wants to be told you're a loser and nobody wants to be in a system where they're told, oh, you have the same opportunities as everyone else, but you don't. And to put it this way, to use, um, I, this is a quote from the internet. Unfortunately, I don't have the source for it, but anybody who has watched the Hunger Games movies or read those books would know the only way to really win the Hunger Games is to not play the Hunger Games. Because one way or the other, if you're in the whole game, you are under the influence of a system that's going to sort you out and you're far more likely to lose and be pulled down than win. 
And increasingly, we have a pattern where winners take everything and losers are left with nothing. And all of this, once again, is deeply toxic to democracy, to political stability. And this is a recurring pattern right now. So part of the question, Part of the problem actually has to do again with how meritocracy interacts with ideas of diversity and equity and inclusion, or the term inclusive excellence, which is found mostly in Canada more than the US. Um, it is often seen as being opposed to meritocracy, although a lot of people will say no, diversity, equity, and inclusion is meant to help correct errors in meritocracy. I will be coming to that very shortly, but nevertheless, there have been experiments that actually test whether or not people see racial or gender minorities as being less qualified than predominant majorities. For instance, in North America, people tend to see somebody who is white and male as being deserving more, having more merit than say somebody who is black and female. And this has actually been, um, proven experimentally. And the big paradox is that informing somebody that a workplace is supposed to be a meritocracy actually results in them thinking in a way that is more clearly racially and gender biased. Um, this particular experiment was conducted by Professor Emilio Castilla from MIT, and his results are quite interesting. It's a matter of public perception rather than absolute, but it is there. So what do you really do about something like this? Like income inequality is there worldwide, but however, meritocracy is supposed to be anti-elitist and fair and justified. Like everybody should get what they deserve, shouldn't they? And yet you have the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, people who really should rise in the system are not rising. And there is a lot of data from the United Kingdom that shows that people believe in a meritocracy increasingly so, even though the United Kingdom has gotten um, increasingly income unequal. We haven't yet gotten data from Canada, from the United States, like all of this is trickling in. It's a matter of the data. There is actually a lot of it here and there, but this particular study was quite interesting. Um, so there are two possible ways out of this. And one of them really has to do with the idea of a better meritocracy, because the idea of a meritocracy does have something inherently fair. We think about it and we say, oh, this is a very fair way of doing things. People should get what they deserve. It's just a matter of tweaking the system so that we measure the right things, so that we have the right people making judgments about what is valuable and reflect the merit of people who are otherwise not privileged. Because what is the opposite of a meritocracy? We don't want to go to a feudal system. We don't want to go to some kind of crazy random system. We want a better meritocracy because it is working. But on the other side, you have other scholars, scholars, policymakers, public intellectuals, who argue that meritocracy fails everybody, including those who rise to the top because of it, because if everybody is working more and more and getting more and more blind to the fact that the system is not working, you have a system that just gets worse, that corrodes democracy, and which is seriously influencing people's ability to be part of the body public. People are not able to relate to those who are different from them, and therefore things are getting worse and worse. We are living in our own little shells. Perhaps there should be even greater diversity in whom we choose. Perhaps there should be a lottery system. Perhaps there should be something other than a meritocracy. And this debate is very far from being settled. Now I'm going to cover a couple of the people who cover some of these ideas, but this is its own little ocean. Um, this is Professor Michael Sandel from Harvard. I've had the privilege of meeting him in person when I was in Boston. Um, and Professor Sandel wrote this book called The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, a very interesting book. And he identifies stalled social mobility and income inequality in the United States as creating a deep backlash, the American dream, the belief that somebody with optimism 
hard work and talent would be able to rise high has proven false for more and more Americans. And the end result of that is that a great number of Americans have become disaffected with their system. They've become angrier. They've become less willing to believe in a lot of fundamental American ideals like democracy, for instance. And he blames that he blames meritocracy for generating this backlash. And he blames people on top of the system, including Wall Street and Ivy League universities for making this meritocratic system even worse. And in a way for being so blindly focused and so narrowly focused on the rewards going to the people on top that they don't understand what it means for people down at the bottom who no longer benefit from it. Among other things, he suggested having a lottery system for students applying to places like Harvard and Yale and Princeton so that students from across America could really get in. Now, increasingly, when it comes to American universities, the entrance is through the SAT test. And SAT scores, it turns out, track parental income very closely. They do not actually track a student's performance in college after the fact. And that is one of the many, many uh, little details that goes and shows that top universities in America, rather than being a meritocracy in the sense that they always want to be, are actually increasingly becoming the um, centers of privilege for privileged students. And this should not be. And Sandal has a very strong argument for it. But then he's not the only one who thinks about the problem or has ideas about what should be. Um, another scholar is Jonathan Mice. Uh, Jonathan was a PhD student at Harvard. Um, He's now a professor at Radboud University, I think, in the Netherlands. I'd have to look it up. But yes, I've actually had the privilege of meeting him myself. And he's probably the world's foremost researcher on meritocracy right now. And he suggests that increased socioeconomic segregation, people living with those of similar backgrounds to them and completely avoiding being with people who are much richer or much poorer, means that people increasingly think that, okay, inequality is not a problem. Merit really matters. There isn't that much social stratification. And as a result, they think that a meritocracy works because they don't see the full spectrum of just how unequal society is. And they don't interact enough with people who are different from them to really see them as human and to really ask, wait a minute, do they deserve so much more or so much less than me? They're only human like me. It's the most basic way of not othering people. And to cut something really long short, like he verges on suggesting that there should be greater socioeconomic diversification. People should be able to live with and mix with and interact with people who are not like them. And that itself is going to change people's perceptions about a meritocracy. Um, he has written and published an enormous amount of work. If you ever search for him, um, it's really amazing. And the third suggestion uh, comes from feminist theory. And this was by Nicolo Belanca, who argued in favor of something else. Rather than having a meritocracy, he argues for an isocracy, where power is distributed in a plurality. Oh. Uh, pardon the typo on the slide, people engage with each other and discuss what is valued and everybody has a share of the power. It does not merely go to those who are at the top and it's not merely about setting criteria for which people are governed. Now, these are just three of the many, many perspectives out there and this is an ongoing debate. So, I'll leave it for the question and answer session here. And I think I'd probably be a lot more comfortable taking questions because like I said, this is a huge area. I could go on talking about this for quite a while and I would be very glad to hear what questions you have for me. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Keisha, for that uh, very informative talk. And I have lots of questions going on in my uh, brain right now. Um, you can uh, feel free to stop sharing your 
um, screen at this time and we can go into a few questions. Um, so uh, just a reminder to um, everyone that you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen uh, to ask any questions. And for any of you who are watching live on Facebook, you're welcome to submit any questions or um, comments through, through the comment section for the video. Um, okay, so we'll wait for some questions to come in. Um, I have a, a question to start us off. Um, so, you know, you mentioned to, you mentioned, you know, uh, in, living in a meritocracy can feel like a dummy, I think was your, <laughs> your word, um, uh, if you're not uh, succeeding. So how does that, does being in a meritocracy relate to our current state of mental health? Um, the issues that we see with more and more people being diagnosed with things like anxiety and depression, for example? Thank you. That is a really good question. And let's put it this way, it is not good, particularly for people who are losing out or people who are being discriminated against in a meritocratic system, because the intense perception of being a loser or being a failure creates further anxiety, further pressure to succeed, even those at the top. The amount of pressure to enter a top university in Canada or the United States is immense. And for kids, the amount of pressure that they are under is absolutely tremendous. And this is especially so for kids whose parents do not have the kind of income for, say, making donations. Like many of the Ivy League schools tend to relax their standards for parents who give large donations, but the vast majority of students can't do that. And they have to rise the hard way. And the end result is they are under tremendous pressure, tremendous anxiety all the time. And unfortunately, this is not acknowledged. Um, I believe that for World Mental Health Day, they actually pointed out that mental health is a human right. This was an actual human right as recognized by the United Nations. And unfortunately, the pressure of being in a meritocratic system, especially for somebody who is a minority, is immense. And it is immensely detrimental for their mental health. Um, I. I hope I had answered that um, well enough. I mean, the short answer is it's not good. Long answer is, well, pretty much like I said. Um, thank you. How would you propose that an organization could update their policies so that they don't completely rely on merit um, to decide things like promotions or hiring? That is a really good question. Um, and this is the interesting part. Now, this actually has to do with diversity hiring. In many instances, say you have somebody who's brought into a position, and this is actually very common um, for women who are brought into high executive positions. They're almost treated as though they're a placeholder until the next guy comes in. And it's almost like they're immensely afraid of being perceived as encroaching on territory that is not there. So the simplest thing is to have one diversity hire be replaced by another diversity hire once they move out of that position, to have kind of a continuity go on to make them feel that they are not placeholders. Um, that's one policy that could be put into place. The other and the bigger problem about merit would be perhaps to actually think in terms of what is fair rather than just what does merit, who has the most merit, because the term itself appears to be racially and gender biased, at least in North America. And I have to, again, say this is, again, from a North American context. Elsewhere in the world, there are going to be entirely different considerations to keep in mind. But fairness would be one of the main areas to look at. And yet again, um. The simple fact that office workers need to interact more with people who are not rated at the same level as them, people who are not considered to be quote unquote meritorious, having more interactions with them would make them really question, wait a minute, is this person really so much above or below me? Um, 
actually implementing that, that is a whole different, like getting more interactions within the office to change people's perceptions of merit within hiring. That is going to take some serious social engineering to do. Like none of these are completely simple or straightforward solutions. Once again, because this is not a straightforward problem to do. So deeply entrenched, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what would you say is, you, you referred to a few different um, possibilities for alternatives, but what would you say is the an alternative to a meritocracy, for example, in things like uh, political positions of power, do we have things like a general lottery um, or certain prerequisites? So how do we get people in a political system such as ours, the right people into the roles? That is a really good question. And that's a question that everybody's been wrestling with for a very long time. That's kind of the eternal question of democracies. How do you get somebody in who really should be there and who is not? And a lot of it, again, depends on getting the correct information out, combating misinformation and disinformation. That is also very much a part of it. Um, the other part, and when it comes to public perception, like how do you change perception? not easily this is going to take a long time to really change perception to really put somebody in a position of power and say okay they're actually up to the job um currently when it comes to public office i know that there is a tendency uh, for politicians to skew much more upper class like the average income of many politicians to begin with is far higher than that of the average person is there a way of bringing in somebody who isn't so well off into a position of political power without necessarily corrupting them? Um, that is definitely something to think about, but here's the whole thing. It's just not going to be easy. What you really need to do when it comes to a democracy is you really need to convince a public that this is the right person to vote into office, because it's not just a matter of me or what I think, it's a matter of what everybody thinks. And there are a lot of things that color that perception, like Jonathan Mice's work really showed it. If you are interacting with people who are different from you, socioeconomically, culturally, and so on, repeatedly on a regular basis, you're no longer going to think in terms of having a very narrow, very elite set of individuals up on top. You're going to be willing to include somebody who's very different into political office. And we certainly are seeing this in terms of political diversity within Canada compared to a couple of generations ago. But this is a slow process. And I don't think it will happen very quickly or very easily. This is just a slow process. But the most important thing is that this slow process continues and that we find ways of acknowledging that people who are not like us or socioeconomically below us actually have the right to power and authority. Slow, it's going to be slow, it's going to be difficult, it won't happen soon. You, you spoke a little bit about um, DEI in your, um, dis, in your presentation, and there is a growing sense that it's being positioned as the antithesis of a meritocracy. Um, and we see that quite a bit in the US. Um, and note that an isocracy may allow for diversity, um, which is a higher expression of meritocracy. So could you expand for um, our audience a little bit on diversity as a platform for merit and fairness or how those um, things work together? Okay, it's like this. The idea of diversity as a platform for merit is by acknowledging that merit isn't restricted to just one social group or category, but rather that it is spread more widely. And if you look as far back as Thomas Jefferson, I mean, his quote about um, periodically sweeping through the rubbish for geniuses, while it is quite offensive by modern standards, actually captures the idea of what diversity is supposed to do, maybe not again, like offensive, but it actually captures the idea. The idea is that there are people across the spectrum, no matter where, who deserve to be in positions of power, who are talented, who are intelligent, who are hardworking, and therefore diversity really helps by making sure that we are not losing out on all this talent and ability that had been excluded due to 
circumstances beyond our control. Like I mentioned before, you cannot control for being born a certain way, for looking like who you are, for being male or female or intersex. You cannot control for any of those things. But if you can make those irrelevant and focus purely on those abilities that matter, you will have a superior meritocracy. That is the belief within, that is the belief about what diversity can do for meritocracy. Of course, once again, there is an opposing view saying that this won't work, but diversity advocates strongly do believe it works. And we have seen evidence of it happening because now we have more and more diverse people entering positions of power. So it's not like it's not working, like there's a long way to go, but yes, diversity and equity and inclusion programs are working. What matters is the implementation and that is a whole different ballgame. But so far, there are programs that work. Diversity is helping a meritocracy. Um, Related to that, um, uh, one of our um, audience members has noted that Ivy League schools stopped using SAT scores during the pandemic, and mm -hmm. in part because they were considered to be unfair um, to socioeconomic um, disadvantaged folks. Um, but since then, many have reinstated it because some, there's been some evidence that uh, showed that the SAT could actually improve the prospects of the socioeconomically disadvantaged. So is that, um, are you familiar with that research or um, any thoughts on, on that? Yes, I have heard about that research, but then I've also seen the contrary research coming out quite strongly. Um, I believe, I still believe that the contrary research, the research showing that the SAT scores actually track socioeconomic status, that they track parental income is a lot more solid. But yet again, like I have to see more evidence come up showing that SATs actually help people of a lower socioeconomic status. I'm not convinced by that just yet. And I think, and, and this is just me. This is just me. Personally, I think the idea to remove taking SAT scores during the pandemic was a good idea. Um, so related to uh, post-secondary and, um, and higher education, um, a lottery may help um, less fortunate students to attend university. Um, so how might a society help those uh, people with student um, debt and need to work while in college and um, other things that might impact their ability to get into university? Oh, yeah, student debt. That is really part of the problem, isn't it? That is, like, let me put it this way. What really matters in this case is publicly funding education. And in fact, I did not include the full Jefferson quote, but Thomas Jefferson actually talked about publicly funding education so that people with merit manage to get through. Like, it's not like the current scholarship system where so many scholarships are loans that you have to pay back and where you have to, like in this case, it's a matter of fully funding public education. And even if you look back, say 40, 50 years ago, public education was so close to free. I personally met, um, an old gentleman who had been a graduate of UMass Boston in the early 1970s. And he said that the amount you pay on books for a single course is the amount that I paid for four years in college, which was completely crazy. But this is actually a matter of funding. This is a matter of public policy within the American system in particular, really it's a matter of just forgiving student debt because in the, and in the American system, it is all federal loans. And I believe in Canada, it's mostly a provincial system. So that is going to be probably a lot more complicated. Um, because I am, and a lot of my research was done, I have to be open about this. A lot of my research was done really in the American context. And there is a lot more data on America than there is about Canada. And there is a very strong case for just forgiving all of that student debt and for trying to cut down to federally subsidize four-year college because education is a 
very much treated as a public good. And that's the way it was until quite recently. And that is the way it really should be, according to these advocates. And that is actually a position that I am very strongly in favor. You, you talked a little bit about the alternatives. Um, what would you say the opposite to meritocracy is? Is that something like communism? No, it, I, uh, if you're talking about the opposite of meritocracy, it is very much like a completely open lottery. Like first, there is no perfect, absolute meritocracy. But if you had a perfect meritocracy, you would have people who were being chosen according to one clear objective criteria and perfectly sorted into their positions. The opposite would be one of complete and absolute randomness. Now, I mentioned again about communist China being intensely meritocratic. The Chinese bureaucratic system is intensely meritocratic. The Chinese educational system is intensely meritocratic. You have students writing exams all the time. I cannot answer to selection in the Chinese Communist Party. That is something that I cannot answer to. But there is a very, very strong belief in meritocracy in China and in the old Soviet Union. Even though the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was not a meritocratic institution by any means, they had a very strong technical meritocracy. And modern Russia continues to actually have a lot of highly qualified scientists and engineers. So meritocracy and communism are actually, like, they're not actually opposed to each other at all. And communist countries have had very strong and, to some extent, functional meritocracies. Um, I can't think of anything else that would really serve as a true opposite of a meritocracy, apart from, like I said, complete randomness. But yeah. So we are running short of time, and there are some really great final question or uh, questions remaining. So I'm going to try to I'm going to do one last question and try to merge a couple. Um, what would you say for individuals is the way forward? If they're if we're experiencing um, things in a meritocracy, if you are a person from um, a traditionally more disadvantaged background, what would you say is the way forward for an individual? That's a very good question. And for an individual, you know what? I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am trying to figure that out myself. Fair answer. Now, let me be fair. There's a limit to what I know, and that's exactly the kind of thing that stumps me as an individual. I'm still trying to figure out whether there is a clear answer to that or not. And to be honest, I don't have that answer. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think your presentation really spoke to how the complexity and um, how deeply entrenched it is in our society, so, and how heavily influenced we are. So that, uh, yeah, makes makes perfect sense. And um, we're gonna have to leave it there for the questions. Um, and, but I wanna thank you again, Keisha, for being with us um, again today. It was really, really informative and an interesting um, talk. And um, I'm just gonna close up now. So you are welcome to now turn off your camera and um, say goodbye. Um, we do, before I let everybody go today, we do have one more poll question for the audience. Um, it is, how would you rate your knowledge now on today's topic following the discussion? And it has now popped up on your screen. Um, and I do want to let everyone know before we go that um, Scholars Hub will return in person on Thursday, April 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time at the Markham Village Public Library. Um, so we want to invite everyone to join us for this special edition of Scholars Hub. It's titled Elusive Desires and the Aesthetics of Difference with Marissa Largo, Assistant Professor from the School of the Arts, Media, Performance and Design. Um, to register for the, that event and learn more about upcoming sessions, because we do have them regularly, uh, please visit yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. And that should also pop up in your chat right now. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody again for coming and again to Keisha for a really great um, presentation and really informative um, and interesting questions. We couldn't get to all of them. Um, thank you, everyone, and be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Heather. And thank you to everyone who asked questions. I would love to answer all of them. And 
I apologize for not being able to answer all of them because your questions are so wonderful. And I hope I've made a difference here. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Oh, wait, wait, I see them. <laughs> 